Hey there everybody, thanks for joining me for another One Man Review. Today I'll be taking a look at the first of two Alak Center volumes put out by Euro Comics. This is The Age of Innocence. The, this is a very famous series by Jose Munoz and Carlos Sampaio. I think plenty of people are aware of this series now. I've seen other people talking about it uh, on, on YouTube. The influence it had on people like Frank Miller. Sean and I got into this particularly because uh, we were interested in the story in volume two where uh, Munoz and Sampaio go after Keith Giffen for supposedly swiping a lot of their art. And we did an episode on that. But we found, Sean and I both found the first volume of this when we were at Comic-Con for the Eisner nomination of Strange Death of Alex Raymond, we found a table that had a couple of these for sale pretty cheap, like half off. So we grabbed those, and obviously I love the artwork in these. I finally had a chance to sit down and go through this first volume, and I don't want to talk about the influences it had or any of that other stuff. I just wanted to go through and kind of make my notes like I would on any other video, just see what I see. Because obviously this is super influential work. Uh, I think anything that's been said about the stylization and the composition and all that's probably already been said. So I just wanted to respond to what I thought about this stuff. You know, is it actually as good as its influence suggests? Yeah, abs absolutely. I think it's some of the best crime noir stuff I've read. And I think the art speaks for itself. This first story in the book, I think, is actually probably not the first Alak Center story that came out. Uh, I didn't see dates on here anywhere. There might be something in there uh, that says, you know, where these these came from. Uh, it says here that they were originally published at 75, 78, 81, and 82. But I don't know the order they came in. Anyone, this first one seems kind of like an origin story with Alak Center. One of the things that I really appreciate about this, and one of the things I think levels it up in terms of one of the best crime noir comics I've read, is that it's it's diving pretty deep into social issues. This first one starts with Alak being a police officer, and it talks about how he get kicked off the, the force, and the racism, and all of those kinds of things that are inherent in the police department. So why he became a detective. This one here, for sure, is in 1975, so I think this is actually the first published Alak Center story. And you can see, even though the art's pretty stylized already, the figure work's not as distorted, the compositional things are there in place, but the, the character work's not as wild as it, as it gets later on. So I think this is probably the first story. And then here where you're starting to see the more unique uh, approach to anatomy, the unique approach to faces, the more cartoonified characterizations, I think that's a later story. So it's really fun to go th through these and see, see how that style evolves. I mean, right from the beginning, like anyone who's looking at this work is going to realize what fantastic compositions there are all the way throughout. I mean, you could pretty much go to any page and look at any composition, and, and you're looking at a beautiful composition with beautiful spotting of blacks, beautiful balance, and then total page compositions as well that work really, really well together. One thing that I, I really enjoy about this work, and I'm sure it's been talked about elsewhere, uh, you know, people talk about the influence on Miller and all that. I think it's also pretty obvious that the artwork had, especially the storytelling, had a huge impact on artists like Eduardo Hizo because there's a lot of things where the environment is the most in, important thing to the composition. Like in this composition here, you have a, a lack in the very, very back as the smallest character. And because the composition is so strong and the word balloons are so strong, you do get drawn to this area. But it really gives the characters a sense of embeddedness in their environment, which I think is always really important for the crime noir, especially crime noir like this that deals with social strata and social situations and the city itself, uh, that embeddedness in the environment is awesome. And so being willing to put your main character in the back of a really packed composition like this, I think is uh, a really cool thing. And then there's some other examples later where there's like these little four or five panel sub stories happening that will weave in and out of the main narrative that is something that Eduardo Hizzo does very well that was you know, famous famous for kind of how they were handling 100 bullets and that kind of stuff. 
This image here is really interesting to me because of what Munoz is doing with the door frame right here. The whole panel is pretty much in a one point perspective. You know, we've got lines going back and then we've got verticals and horizontals everywhere. And the verticals everywhere are very straight, but right here all of a sudden the verticals like flare out like the doors in three point perspective and we're seeing it from the top a little bit. Um, it's totally an air in the perspective of the drawing, but what it does is it gives a real sense of like emotional d distortion around that focal point. And I think that's really clever. And I also think it's really well done. A, a lot of people that would try something similar would look like an accident, like they'd failed in what they were doing with perspective. But with Munoz, you almost don't even notice it. He just lands the kind of emotional impact that he's trying to get out of having an improperly drawn bit of perspective, and I, I find that really compelling. This little piece here gives a good example of what I'm talking about with the social commentary being what makes crime noir really good, in my opinion. This one is uh, a bit about drugs, and I'll just read this here. John's detox, but the whole time he was doing that, a hundred other black men started down the path to dope. Numbers impossible to control with your philosophical solution. You'd rather we'd done nothing, John is a lax friend, and a lack, then a lack says, a lax just in one. I've told you before, Whitey, we don't need help from powerful people because we've got our own power, hope. Y'all are losing. You can see it in your eyes, but thanks to the thing with John, the brother can serve us better when he's healthy. So I really like that. And then you have a lax saying, me, powerful? You know, he's, he's like, I got kicked out of the police force. I'm just a, a bum uh, detective, all of this stuff, and... His, the gal that's with him here says, who knows, Alak, maybe they're right. Let's go to have a drink at my place. I'm feeling lonely. So I really like that. I really like that each one of these stories, not all of them, but most of them delve into these kind of social situations. And I think it's really good. This piece here as well, I think is uh, really well written. I went home and idly browsed the newspaper. My argument with Omo had ruined the evening, of course. On the same day I had been proposed to, and I had seen a once hopeless friend, now safe and sound again. If those words mean anything in this city, I fell asleep looking at the photo in the paper. The president with a baby in his arms. I dreamed the president hugged the child until he crushed it, and then he ate it. He wasn't hungry, but he ate it anyways. And that last little bit about he wasn't hungry, but he ate it anyways, like you could see is this perfect way of wrapping up this whole story about like how greed ruins the world. You know, you're, you don't even need these things anymore. You're just taking them because you can. And that's the, the kind of writing that Sampaio is contributing. And I really enjoy that. The story Life Ain't a Comic Book Baby is an interesting example of the meta insertion of the authors into the story. Except in, in this one, usually when the author inserts themselves, they're inserting themselves as the author. You get like the Dave Sim, Grant Morrison trick where they're like coming down from some higher dimension. This one's interesting because Munoz and Sampaio are basically in the story, out of control of the story. They're just following along with the lack to see how his day goes because they're trying to, you know, they're trying to write a comic book about a detective in New York, which is what a lack center is. And so they're supposedly coming to a lack to follow him around and do some research. So I think that's really interesting subversion of that insertion of the author where it makes the authors look like bumbling fools and the main characters kind of leading instead of the other way around. Here we have in the dialogue, Alak says, Hey pals, life ain't a comic book. Or maybe it is, but the danger's real. You're starting to get on my nerves. So they're referencing the title of the story there, which is pretty fun. This panel here is where you really see the flip of that meta insertion, where Sinner takes control. I thought of Munoz and Sampaio and their detective who had my name. How would they have solved this rotten story? Had I killed him? Had Mr. Gross or Demetrius himself? Was it suicide? Then I thought, wouldn't they be the ones who'd killed him with their own imagination? In that case, it would be all a dream and we could turn back the clock. Yeah, writing murder stories is easy because paper never stinks of death. But Mr. Cagney was dead and I was being charged with the crime. I felt like seeing the dynamic duo to, to ask them about this. I was taken to the precinct where I spent the night before falling asleep. I thought about my life as a 
comic book character and I said to myself, yeah, to be continued. So there he's not only like taking the control of the narrative from them, but obviously he's the narrator the whole time. And I, re I really enjoyed that self-awareness of that story. When I first saw it, I was like, okay, you know, like I I've seen these kind of tricks plenty of times. I usually enjoy them when I see them, but at this point a little tired and I feel like they, they really played that out. Towards the end of this story, you do get this really funny sequence here where uh, you see Munoz at the drawing board basically drawing the page that we're looking at, which is another one of those typical meta insertion tricks that are always fun. And in this one, it's extra funny because Alak has a kind of asserted his dominance over the flow of the story. And at the end, you see the authors trying to reclaim some of that to some extent with some Pio writing and Munoz drawing the page they're working on. But in the end, Alak pretty much takes over. The sequence here is one of the great examples that I can point out where they're doing these side narratives, this kind of technique that I believe Eduardo Hizo definitely took from the Alak Center work. I don't know if this is something Sampaio's writing into his scripts or if this is something that Munoz does to keep himself busy. I don't know how their collaboration worked. But what's going on here is you have Alak Center and this character, Mr. Ferrari, having a conversation in a building. And that conversation continues all the way through and it's pretty text heavy. You could see this as like just being a bunch of talking heads. So Munoz and Sampaio do something really interesting where here you see Ferrari at the window. Then they're going to zoom out and mention Ferrari. I'm still charged with the murder that you admit you're authorized. So you know that these are these characters talking, but they're now in the building. It's like that example earlier where Alak's really small in the back. Now you can't even see him. He's just inside of this building. And they continue to have their conversation as this other sequence outside plays on where this guy uh, has a workplace accident. And then you come back inside to the characters while there's also the uh, ambulance coming up. But you can still see the window they're talking through. I think that's a really great storytelling technique that, like I said earlier, embeds the, the person in a larger situation. I think a lot of stories stay too contained just to the main players, and so you lose a sense of space and place. This is a really great way to do it. It's also a really great way to avoid boring sequences where it's just talking heads forever. You set up enough context for the talking heads, and you can have this little like extra bit of story information, extra bit of world building that's not 100% rel relevant to the story, but is like thematically relevant going on. And that's such a great way to layer up meaning. So I, I see why like Azarello and Hizo st stole that, but I'm pretty sure that's a Muno Sampaio creation. Here you get a fun admission from Sampaio, 15 years making comics and I've never drawn a urinal. So basically, this is like Sampaio's asking him to do something, and he doesn't want to do that drawing. I don't want to do this drawing of myself with the urinal. I'm not going to draw a urinal now. That's pretty funny. At the end of the story, you start to get a bit of a sense of Munoz and Sampaio's, or at least Sampaio's, but Munoz is saying it here. Uh, you get a sense of their political affiliations as revolutionaries. Uh, they they have Munoz saying, no exceptions. When the time comes, it will be too late to sort out the innocence. As for innocence, that's something we'll have to talk about. And I, I do think there's a suggestion in there that they're like, because they're having a conversation about the CIA and FBI and North America and that kind of stuff. And I do have a feeling that they're suggesting that when the time comes, when the revolution comes, like, you know, there there will be no innocence. And uh, that's a bit of a scary proposition, but, uh, you know, I, that is seems to be what they're saying there. At the end of the story, then, there is a, another little bit that references revolutions with this little chant of Lisbon, 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 and the note at the bottom saying, in 1974, a homegrown, virtually bloodless progressive revolution in Portugal drew the attention of covert agencies from superpowers on both sides of the ideological divide. So they do land at the end of it, even though this is kind of this fun meta insertion trick. The whole story is also looking at this larger idea of revolution against governments, covert government agencies, superpowers, and all of that kind of stuff. So really complex storytelling through that one, lots of different layers to it. 
And that's that's the kind of thing that tips this over for me into like, you know, one of the great crime novels of all time, besides just having amazing art. In this story, Twinkle, Twinkle, there's some really interesting pages, this very first page being one of them, where there's all of a sudden, not only like is the distortion in the character work ramping up, but there's some very interesting inking going on where Munoz is using a lot more hatching and cross-hatching, something he doesn't normally do. Normally it's like this, like clean lines with big chunky black slapped in there. Uh, that's kind of an interesting look, and it, it's fun to see someone who comes out the gate already so masterful pushing themselves to find their own voice even more. Like in the beginning, the character work does feel a little more classic, even though the compositions are strange. But as the characters start to distort, as Munoz starts playing with techniques and stuff. It's really, really exciting to watch all that play out. It, you'll see more of that in this page here where you can see the influence uh, on some of like the marks that Frank Miller makes when he gets more textural, some of the stuff that he was doing like in Ronin, works like that. And I think you can also see some influence that was had on Barry Windsor Smith, or at least I see something in these panels, especially this one here, and some of these that feel a lot like what Barry Windsor Smith was doing in the book Monster. I don't know that he's actually seen any of this work. Different artists can totally come to the same approach through their interest in similar precedents or whatever. So I'm not saying this is a direct influence on him. It, it seems pretty obvious it's a direct influence on Miller. But I see a lot of Barry Windsor Smith in these as well, which is it's really interesting. It's fun to see someone playing and, and swerving their style a little bit. Alak himself develops to be become a very complex character. I think one of the things I have a problem with in a lot of crime noir detective stuff is the detective's kind of the... I don't know, and I'm not super versed in this, so I could be totally wrong on it, but my impression is that a lot of the times the detective's like the least interesting character in a lot of these stories. It's more about the mystery or whatever, but as these progress, like you really get a sense of a lack as a person who's also growing. So it's a, a, you know, a political like commentary, but it's also a very personal character driven character study in a lot of the stories. Like in this one in particular, you find out about a, a lack ha having a love interest in this one woman and he's feeling lonely, but he wants love. I like that insertion of these kind of more personal character driven moments and these, they, they make it land. As the stories go and as Munoz's style starts to get wilder and more cartoonified, more abstracted, some of the stories start to get weird as well. Like in this one, he's either drunk or he's hallucinating or something. There's a very surreal sequence here where he's going into America's Miss and Mr. Ass or Muscle. You have like women showing their asses in frames. There's these big buff guys. There's these weird fish creatures going in. Some of these, I think, uh, like this almost gets hard to interpret to me. Like the abstraction gets to be too much and it's too strange and surreal. But I see some strategies in here that are really interesting. And I think, again, not knowing if it's a direct influence or not, but panels like this where they almost lead towards pure abstraction or these twisted like body horror distorted forms remind me of like an artist like Banu Pratap. Uh, what they're doing. And so I think that's really exciting. It's always exciting to see when someone was kind of scratching at the future from a long, long time in the past. You know, this is in the 70s or 80s. And now we're kind of seeing these approaches to comics coming into full fruition. This page here, again, we're looking at a much more distorted, simplified style now, which is, I think, the stuff that really, really influenced everyone. And it's very hard for me to look at like the, the way that this character is drawn in particular and not see an influence on Jeff Lemire, who's writing an art I also really like. I think that's one of the fun things for me about going back and looking at these bastards that have been around for a while but have been ignored or are only getting translated or I'm just kind of like this has been out for a while but I'm finally able to get a hold of it and read it. Uh, is to, to track all of those influences. When you look at someone like this that's so revolutionary in their art, you want to know, A, how did they come to this, which I don't have as many good guesses about. It, it did say that he was also working with, uh, I, I think it was Alberto Breccia, that he was his teacher, but learning from him. So you see some of that influence there. I, I could 
could have got that wrong, but I think that's what it was in this book that they were saying that. But then also, like I said, going forward, it's really interesting to, to see and wonder, like, oh, is that where Jeff Lemire got all of his approach from? Is that an influence on him? Has he even read this work? Are they just looking at similar things? But it's really hard not to see that in this face. Uh, this story here, where it's about Alak meeting his dad, another one of these really great character development pieces, has another awesome sequence as well, where you see where how Rizzo took this, or Hizo, I'm not sure uh, which pronunciation, Spanish or Portuguese, but it it's uh, where the, he's taken this approach with these side narratives going on. So here, while uh, Lack and his dad are having a conversation, there's this other side story going on. Again, they're back in the window talking, uh, but there's this other side story with this large woman being chased out by this guy with a, a whip. And, you know, those things sometimes interact with the story that's going on and sometimes it's not. But I'm really, really impressed by that storytelling technique. It's cool to see where Rizzo got it from. And it's something that I'm going to have to think about in my own works because it's so effective for like doubling or tripling up meaning. It's kind of like a storytelling double entendre if you use it right. And that's really cool. Uh, yeah, I could go on and on about these. I probably won't do a review of volume two because we already looked at the one story in there. I will we'll see if I find anything in there beyond what I'm saying in this video to talk about. But if you have not read the Alak Center stuff, this is something that everyone should get. These are pretty cheap because they're they're 30 bucks for these big like 400 page volumes. They're on what feels like actual newsprint. It's kind of a crappy paper. I wish this had been printed on nicer, brighter paper, nice bright white paper to really let the art shine because the, the contrast, the tenebrism in these is really, really beautiful. Tenebrism, by the way, not chiaroscuro. Everyone gets that wrong. The proper art term is uh, for harsh black and whites is tenebrism. But if, if you haven't read this stuff, I can confirm having gone through it now that the, this is not only just beautiful artwork, something that obviously had an impact on a lot of our favorite artists, but also really, really well told stories and just like essential crime noir comics that definitely should not be missed. There are two collections of these. They're about 30 bucks a piece. And, uh, you know, they did that. They did this type of uh, printing on this cheap paper to keep keep those cheap and affordable. The reproduction itself is actually really, really nice. It looks like they had access to either uh, you know, really nice negatives or the original art. So there's a lot to learn here uh, from an artist's perspective, a storytelling perspective, and then just a lot of really enjoyable stories. I'm glad I got these. And, you know, Sean and I got these. They were being remaindered, I think. So there's probably a good amount of these out there if you've not got them already. House on Fire by Matt Battaglia is a just gorgeous book where Matt's kind of making an emotional response to the the years of COVID and wrapping that into a sci-fi dystopian future that really the sci-fi dystopian's backgrounded and you're fo focused on the emotional journey of two characters in a really beautiful way and then that's enhanced by Matt's like really awesome loose kind of Paul Popish um, dry brush work and then Sh Sean and Matt have worked to get this second kind of orange spot color in there that's going to look really really beautiful and it has allowed Matt to use his dry brush technique to add tone to the thing too so um, with Sean's production technique this is going to be a gorgeous book with a lot of heart make sure to like smash that subscribe button and ring that bell